Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Thank you for not going leaf peeping, <laughs> but staying right here. And I actually think where it's getting really beautiful all around us. Uh, but I went, uh, we went leaf peeping yesterday, and let me tell you, the traffic was atrocious. <sighs> All right, we do have three maple trees in my yard, so I did say to Jamie, I said, just take a chair and look at our own trees. <laughs> and that's plenty of leaf peeping. But I welcome you to our worship service this morning. Please know that whoever you are or wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here to worship and participate at the First Congregational Church in Sharon, Massachusetts. Uh, welcoming back Sumi Lee as our musician for today. I think we get you one more Sunday and then we are, we're having somebody else play or me or Jamie, or who knows, and, but we'll get Sumi back in November. We are interviewing for the position, so never know what's going to happen. Um, I just want to let you know that Gail is out of the office this week. She has, uh, she's using up some vacation time, um, so I'm trying to hold down the fort uh, the food pantry will be open. Uh, I will be in the office pretty much from 9, 9.30 to 4, so if there's anything you need, uh, please call and I'll help as much as I can. I want to just uh, draw your attention to our Oktoberfest uh, celebration. It is simply an opportunity to get together, to eat together, um, to uh, play some games and to have some fun together. Um, please buy your tickets because as I, if I know numbers, it's easier to uh, buy the food. It's also figuring out if this is a go, if we're ready for it. Um, I know we are careful about uh, the pandemic and uh, about staying healthy and wanting everyone among ourselves to stay healthy, so we'll play it by ear. I also want to draw your attention, you might have seen a little start of the discussion on stewardship. We are beginning our campaign. Uh, you will receive a letter in November and on November 20th, it will be the ingathering of pledges. Um, don't underestimate your pledge in the whole budget process. Uh, it is your commitment that keeps our church going. So, as I said in my first little um, article, pray over it. And why, you know, stewardship is about giving, but why should you pray about it? Well, I think praying, praying over it sets the tone. We're figuring out why, who are we? Whose are we? Why are we doing this? Why do we want this church to be here, to thrive for you, for your family, uh, and for this community? So you will uh, get more uh, little articles uh, through our weekly communications in the bus. Are there any other announcements at this point in time? If not, then I invite you to join me in our call to worship. Our world offers many wide avenues and beautiful boulevards to walk. But our God invites us to walk the road of service and sacrifice. Our society suggests we put down our roots in the shallow soil of pleasure and greed, but our God seeks to plant us on the banks of hope, watered by the rivers of joy and grace. Our culture promotes achievement, success, climbing to the top, ringing the bell. But our God tells us if we want to be first, 
we need to go to the end of the line. Let us worship our God of wisdom, of grace, and of love. Our first hymn is number 58, Lavish Love, Abundant Beauty, Let Us Rise. Please be seated. Will you please join me in our opening prayer? O oh God, our protector, we take refuge in you. You alone are the source of all our good. We seek to be counted among the godly and upright, but we confess that we have run after other powers, and we have brought trouble upon ourselves and others. O oh Lord, our portion and our cup, you sustain us and lead us in good and pleasant ways. We confess that we have trusted in false wisdom and set our hearts on short-sighted and worldly desires. Forgive us, God, our life. Help us set you always before us and sustain us in your righteousness. Let our hearts be glad, our spirits rejoice, and our bodies rest in hope. For you do not abandon us to our mistakes and let your chosen ones dwell in darkness. In Christ you show us the path of life. You welcome us into the joy of your presence. You feed us with pleasures forevermore. Hear us as we pray. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Today's scripture reading is from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. Jesus and his disciples passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Thanks be to God. I once read a story of a young woman who wanted to go to college, but her heart sank when she read the question on the application that asked, are you a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she wrote, no, and returned the application expecting the worst. To her surprise, she received this letter from the college. Dear applicant, A study of the application forms reveals that this year, our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that they have at least one follower. (laughs) When my extended family found out that I was planning to go to seminary with the most likely goal of becoming a minister. I got some very interesting reactions. Some showed surprise and others were, I think, a bit doubtful if I was cut out for ministry. Believe it or not, I was then on the quiet side. We were talking about this at coffee hour last week. Um, I was pretty introverted, and my Myers-Briggs proves it. I was not the go-getter like my sister. I had no desire to be on the, at the top of my class. I was okay. I was about third or fourth, but didn't want to get to the top. I had no desire to ever be class president, although I did get talked into it in the upper grades. Now, I think really my family thought because of being quiet, I was not really leadership material. A good worker and follower, yes, but they couldn't imagine me being a leader of a congregation or a leader that the church needed. I was not, as they were, I believe, concerned, striving for the most possible greatness. Now, the discussion of what constitutes greatness has been with humanity since the beginning of dawn. Each generation asking, what is the measure of ultimate greatness? What is the measure of being the greatest? And the world has set forth measurements and ideas of what constitutes being successful, what dictates greatness, what it means to be number one. And many of all, if not all, define our life's achievements based on these arbitrary, arbitrarily defined categories. If you score a 1600 at your SATs, you are great. Winning an Olympic gold medal, you are great. Having raised a healthy and well-adjusted child, you did great. 
when your portfolio, financial portfolio, allows you to retire at 35, you really did great. For most of us, I suspect, greatness is about being number one, a winner, a success. It's about really power, control, wealth, fame, reputation, status, and position. Because, here's the thing, have you ever seen a losing Super Bowl team dancing around with two fingers in the air and shouting on Monday mornings, we are number two, we are number two? Probably not, and you probably never will. Or can you imagine a political slogan about making America least or a servant of other countries? And who wants to be a servant of all anyways? That's for others to deal with. Maybe the poor, maybe the uneducated minorities or foreigners. And those we can get away with paying less than a living wage. At least, that's often how it works today. Being last and being servant of all is not usually what we strive for. It is not the greatness which we aspire to. If being great, holding the number one position, means being last of all and servant of all, we have completely misunderstood what greatness is really about. And we are in good company because the disciples in our passage from Mark don't understand greatness either, any more than we do. What were you arguing about along the way, Jesus asked them. But they were silent because they had argued with one another who was the greatest, the best, the most faithful, the most likely to succeed disciple. But Jesus didn't get an answer to his question, only silence, because I think it was the silence of having been caught, of having been found out. Jesus isn't asking for his sake, but for theirs. He seems to have already known what they were arguing about. And interestingly, their argument happened on a public road, out in the open. But Jesus' question, however, is asked in the privacy and interior space of a house. It is really metaphorically, to think about it, it is about more than a change of physical location. Jesus here is moving this conversation inward. He's not gathering information for himself, but inviting the disciples' self-reflection on what it means to be great, on what it means to be a follower. If you see underneath our scripture reading, I gave you a few lines. Um, and these are from the video that this sermon series is based on. So this is the grouping for this Sunday. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Jesus is presenting the disciples with an image and the reality of their better selves, and he is doing it so for us. Jesus is not saying that we should not or cannot be great. He never says that. Rather, he is asking us to reframe our understanding of greatness. What does it mean? What does it look like for you and me to be great in today's world? That is the question. So Jesus sets them down and gives them a leadership seminar right there. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he shows them what he meant by that. Actually, that's the scripture I didn't give you this morning. 
He is scooping up a little child in his arms. Now we know Jesus had a fondness for children, right? They wanted to know who was greatest, so he showed them. Probably 26 inches tall, limited vocabulary, unemployed, zero net worth, a nobody. But God's agent, the last, the least of all. God's world and God's values, he says, are very different from ours, from the world. Now, I want to be careful here. Jesus is not saying that greatness is being a child, and he doesn't say that greatness is in being childlike. Greatness is in welcoming the child. And in theory, that doesn't sound too difficult or challenging, right? Who wouldn't welcome a little child? But Jesus really isn't talking about children. He's talking about what the child represents. We so romanticize and sentimentalize children and childhood in today's culture that it can be difficult to understand what Jesus is getting at. The child is a symbol, a metaphor for something else. The child is a symbol of vulnerability, of powerlessness and dependency. The child in Jesus' day had no rights, no status, no economic value. The child was a consumer and not a producer. Greatness, Jesus says, is in welcoming and receiving into our arms one like this, regardless of his or her age. Greatness is found not in what we have accomplished, Jesus says, and gain for ourselves, but in what we have done and given to the last of these, be it the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the imprisoned, the symbolic children in our lives, in our world. Think about a family member or a nurse's aide who bases, changes, and cares for the elderly, the sick, the dying, those are the great ones, Jesus said. I can't help but think about our food pantry and our volunteers and how they, week after week, serve those who come to get food to feed their families. Or our friend Betty Outla, who right now is downstairs and stops by the church pretty much every day to organize our storeroom or already who brought bread this morning, Sheldon, our breadman, as we call him, who comes twice a week and drops off donations that he picks up from Shaw's. Or our neighbor, Susan Slater, who drops off bags filled with donations for every food pantry pretty much every Sunday morning. They are. They should be called in our eyes the great ones. And you have people like that in your life. Greatness never puts itself in a position of superiority over another. It's not about me, my nation, my tribe, my people, my religion, my politics, my bank account, my house, my job, my accomplishment, my reputation, my status. Our greatness is revealed in our service and care of others, regardless of her or his ability or willingness to pay, repay, or return the favor. When Jesus talked about loving others, even when they do not love us, doing good to those who do not do good to us, Lending without expectation of repayment and inviting to supper those who cannot invite you back. He was describing greatness. Many of his stories or the stories about him, his ministry, are about that kind of greatness. Greatness comes when we share with others who have nothing to share with us. Another scripture, think of the child who shares his five loaves and two fish 
with 5,000 people who contributed nothing but their hunger. That was a great example. Greatness comes when we forgive one who has neither asked for our forgiveness nor changed his or her behavior. Those who refuse to carry bitterness and envy toward others are great. When we respond to the needs of others, when we refuse thoughts and actions of hatred or prejudice, it is then that greatness comes. Our refusal to objectify the opposite sex or to join in jokes about minorities and foreigners is an act of greatness. When we overcome fear, tear down walls, or make room for one who is different, vulnerable, and in need, that's greatness. Greatness is not something to be achieved or earned. It is a quality that arises within us when our lives are in balance and we step into our better selves. And yeah, that is, I believe, the life that Jesus offers us. That's the life I want to live. In that sense, yeah, I want to be great. Don't you? This kind of greatness happens in the simple, ordinary, and mundane. It often goes unnoticed and unnamed, but it is there. And greatness is always a choice set before us. The world's understanding of greatness is always there, always tempting us, always calling us. But there is another greatness the greatness of the last and the greatness of the servant of all. I wonder sometimes who the child, the metaphorical child is that Jesus will set before us. I wonder which greatness you and I will choose. Whoever wants to be first must be last of all. Jesus said, and servant of all. Amen. As we enter into our time of prayer, uh, I invite you to take a list at the people and families we have been praying for. Of course, we keep in our hearts and prayers the people in Florida and North Carolina dealing 
and we'll be dealing for the near future with the damage that Ian, the Hurricane Ian has done and of course the loss of life which has reached over 100 people. Um, is there anyone in our midst that isn't listed here that you would like to mention? Okay. Then my friends, I invite you to uh, join me uh, saying when I say God of wisdom, draw near to us as a response to the prayer this morning. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we look around the world and we see places where people cry out to you, in places torn by the ravages of war, in countries and areas, our own country demolished by natural disasters, by all the places in this world where there are no jobs, no future, no hope. In families across our state who have been devastated by the opioid addiction, by the pandemic, help us to bear your light, O oh God, in the places of this world that need illumination and healing. God of wisdom, draw near to us. Gracious God, give us a gentleness born of wisdom that we might go out into the world and serve as your ambassadors. And in order to do that, bless us with a wisdom needed to do so. A wisdom that is first pure, that is peaceable, that is gentle, that is willing to yield, willing to be last full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. God of wisdom, draw near to us. God of all mercy and grace, give us the courage to seek you out, to search our hearts for your truth, to be guided by the stories of scripture, since our hearts do not rest until they rest in you. Lead us to the pastures of your protection, that we might be faithful members of your flock. God of wisdom, draw near to us. Healing God, we pray for those among us this day who need your love and our love. For those who struggle with depression's grip. For those who journey with physical disabilities. For those who are lonely. For those who are hopeless. For those who are addicted. For those who are angry and bitter. For those who are broken and battered. And for those we lift up to you in our hearts this day. God of wisdom, draw near to us. Giver of hope and truth, hear us today as we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is number 444, Lord of all hopefulness, let us rise.
Please be seated. As you go out into the world, go in confidence and peace, joyfully serving the Lord who walks with you. Bring, bring hope to the hopeless, joy to those who sorrow, and peace to the afflicted. Be a true witness to the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.